In section 2c then I'd like to talk about some essential types of matrices. To begin with, let's start with uh, something called the identity matrix. So the identity matrix is usually written as a capital I, and I'll indicate the subscript here too to indicate the fact that I'm talking about or referring to the two by two identity matrix. So the identity matrix is always a square matrix and the subscript indicates essentially the dimension of that matrix. By definition, the identity matrix looks like this. We place ones on the main diagonal for the identity and zero on all the off diagonal elements. So for instance, if I wanted to consider the identity matrix in three dimensions, three by three matrix, I would once again place ones on the main diagonal and zeros on all the off diagonal places. And the defining feature of the identity matrix in an algebraic sense is that when I multiply any square matrix times the identity matrix, I get that matrix back. So in other words, A, let's say A is an n by n matrix, times the identity is equal to A itself. Also a nice uh, algebraic property of the identity is the order in which I multiply a matrix by the identity doesn't matter. So the identity matrix we would say commutes with any matrix A and it produces that matrix itself. So it acts as an identity element. It's important to note that even though the identity matrix is commutative by multiplication with any matrix in general, of course, matrix multiplication is not commutative. So let's see how the identity matrix works then. So we'll choose our nice example A, let's say is one, two, three, four. What happens then in a two by two case when I multiply by the identity matrix? And let's just see, in fact, yes, we do get back A in both cases or from both directions here. So let's just to make this simple, do one, one case. Let's multiply A on the left by the two by two identity matrix. So once more, matrix multiplication begins with row one dotted with column one and so forth and the resultant matrix. So one zero dotted with one three gives me one uh, plus zero. So I get one here. And then I move on to the second column. So row one dotted with column uh, two gives me one times two is two plus zero times four is zero. So I get a two here, sure enough. Now I've exhausted the first row for multiplication. So I move on to the second row. I take row two, dot it with column one, and I get zero plus three, sure enough. Moving on to the last vector here, the last column, zero, one, I dot that with the vector two, four, and I get four. So indeed, the identity times A results in A. So we want to think of the identity matrix as acting like the number one for our real number system. In other words, when I multiply any number by one, I get back that number. So it's important to see that connection. The identity matrix is very important in linear algebra in the sense that it has to do with something called an inverse matrix. So first off, not all matrices are invertible. Not all matrices have an inverse. Generally speaking, we talk about the inverse of a matrix for a square matrix, an n by n matrix. So let's just put it like this. If A is invertible, then there exists, we can say, a matrix A inverse, we'll notate it with a superscript, uh, which is also n by n, such that when I multiply A by its inverse, I get the identity matrix. So we can sort of suppress the subscripts here. In other words, A times A inverse equals the identity, and in the reverse direction, A inverse A equals the identity. So essentially, if a matrix A is invertible, there is some matrix out there that we could find that essentially cancels that matrix by multiplication. Let's look at a quick example. Let's call a, the matrix one, two, three, four, then I'm gonna claim that there is an inverse out there for that matrix, and that matrix is negative two, one, three halves, and negative one half. So if I multiply A times A inverse, we should end up with the identity. And we just do a little bit of arithmetic here, but we have negative two, uh, plus three, so that's gonna result in one when I take the dot product. Now I take row one dotted with uh, column two in the right matrix, and I have one times one is one, minus one is zero, so now I move down to the second row. 
dot that row with the first column, and I have negative 6 here, uh, plus another 6, so that's going to result in 0. And lastly, I take row 2 and dot it with column 2, and I have 3 and minus 2 results in 1. So sure enough, there is the identity matrix. And again, if I had swapped the order of multiplication here for the inverse of a times a, that would also result in the identity. If I have, for instance, a matrix equation, um, it works in many ways analogously to an algebraic equation with real valued variables. And let's say I know this matrix A and I know this matrix B, but I want to solve for this matrix over here, X, which is kind of my unknown matrix. Well, if A is invertible, then it stands to reason I could multiply both sides of this equation by A inverse. And if I do that, we have these sort of nice properties of matrices, many of which are kind of familiar from the real numbers. So matrix multiplication, although it isn't commutative, it's associative. So in other words, I can associate A inverse A first, multiply those two matrices together, which yields the identity matrix. When I then multiply the identity matrix times X on the left-hand side, that leaves me, of course, by definition with just the matrix X. And now I have solved a matrix equation for an unknown matrix X in this case. So there's one nice Certainly very common application of applying inverse matrices to solve a matrix equation.